Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Robert Van Aden. I head up APSA Stockbrokers, and a warm welcome to each and all. I know some of you are guests of APSA. Um, I know you some guests of just one lap, so welcome to everyone. This is the view of Saxo Bank. Uh, Sten Jacobson is the chief economist of Saxo Bank, and it's their view. So Barclays Africa, Barclays PLC, APSA, APSA Stockbrokers, and all affiliates do not um, subscribe or underwrite the view of tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure being back in Johannesburg. Of course, um, as Robert just said, he's disclaimed just about anything. So if there's any credibility left uh, for me to speak about, I probably have to do my own disclaimer first. I apologize, I know a few of you may have heard me speak before, I'm an economist, I only have one joke, but I think it's a good one, so I'm gonna tell it to you, because it tells you something about my ability to predict anything. So here it goes. Albert Einstein dies, and of course Einstein has to go to heaven, but as he turns up on the uh, uh, gate, at the, at the pearly gate, he's met by the gatekeeper, and the gatekeeper says, Mr. Einstein, we are extremely sorry, but you're a little bit too early. And uh, he's, uh, the, he goes on and says, but Mr. Einstein, would you mind meeting your three roommates while we prepare the apartment? And of course, Einstein being a nice man says, uh, absolutely, it would be my absolute pleasure. So they move on into the bar, and there are three gentlemen standing by the bar. And the first one comes forward and says, my name is uh, Robert Jones, I have an IQ of 160. Einstein smiles and goes, absolutely brilliant, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, black matters, there's gonna be great uh, dinner table conversations. And the next gentleman goes forward and says, uh, my, need, my name is Peter Anderson, my IQ is 150. Again, Einstein smiles and goes, absolutely brilliant, fractal math, this is gonna be brilliant at dinners. And then the third person is standing back a little bit, hesitant to move forward, but you know, it gets so embarrassing that finally he moves forward and goes, hello, Mr. Einstein, my name is uh, Steen Jacobson. I have an IQ of 50. And Einstein looked totally confused. But after a couple of minutes, he goes, ah, Mr. Jacobson, so which way is the stock market going? So after, after Robert's disclaimer and after my IQ disclaimer, I feel that I can pretty much say anything right now and get away with it. So let me say it's, uh, it's a big surprise to me even that uh, England has decided twice to leave the EU over the course of the last seven days. <laughs> I have to say the first time they left was slightly more honorable than the second one last night especially because uh, Iceland, who used to be Danish, and I'm Danish, was the better team on the, uh, on the pitch yesterday. So fully deserved, 320,000 people beating a nation of 60 million, quite impressive. And that's actually also sort of some of the tasks we are facing in terms of what goes on with the marketplace. But let's start where we should start, because this is about the Brexit, and I think I can see the audience in here is probably old enough to, to, to appreciate that the Yes Minister's TV series in the UK in the 1980s, Mr. James Haggard, the Prime Minister, asked his bureaucrat, and I tell his bureaucrat what Europe is, he says, you know what they say about the average EU official? He has the organizing uh, ability of the Italians, the flexibility of the Germans, the modesty of the French, chopped up with imagination of the Belgians, the generosity of the Dutch, and the intelligence of the Irish. This is 1980. And by the way, if you want to see and understand why Europe went wrong, please go to YouTube and watch, I think there's only 11 episodes of Yes Prime Minister, but it tells you everything you need to know about the uh, UK policies. In another episode, the, uh, the head of department uh, is trying to explain the foreign office policy stand on the EU, and it starts like this, yes, Prime Minister, the Foreign Ministry is for the EU because they are against it. <laughs> and that's exactly what goes on in Europe, ladies and gentlemen. It is a problem that 
I think we all agree that the internal market is something good. The European <coughs> concept of a common Europe is a good thing. The free labor movement, the financial service uh, act, all of that is good. But we have reached a state where there was too much Brussels and too little individual policies being conducted. I think the total irony, of course, is that UK, ahead of the referendum, negotiated a deal which meant that voting themselves out of the Brexit was useless. UK actually got everything they wanted from Brussels ahead of the referendum and still decided to leave. So we have to, as investors, and into the macrocosmos of what goes on in the world, including in South Africa, to understand why would anyone, irrationally to some extent, vote to leave a club they were never members of? And secondly, for the part they were a member of, they didn't pay for it, and basically they could do whatever they want. And that's because the social fabric, the social contract, globally has been broken. So the Brexit vote was never about whether you wanted to stay or leave the EU. It was about the ability of the average person in Newcastle, Bristol, Manchester, to give what they in England call the inverted Churchill, right? Two middle fingers. I think the rest of the world is one finger, so I'm not going to do it. The, I'm going to do it the English way. It's more, uh, it's more classy, classy to do it that way. But the ability of the establishment, uh, the, the 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 voters to give the establishment uh, the middle fingers is actually what goes on across the board in the world. That's also why Trump is far more likely to be American president than you think. So right now the polls are saying uh, he's losing ground. He's ten points behind Clinton. But tell you what, if the U.S. economy is running close to recession, which I will show you it is by the time they get to the election, I think a lot of people in America will come out and vote for Trump because what is Mrs. Clinton? If she is not the quintessential elitist, talking down to the voters person, uh, morally corrupt in every sense of the world, at least Trump is openly corrupt. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Clinton is only overtly corrupt. So I think what you see, what you saw in Spain over the weekend, what we, you will see in the French election, what we see is this bifurcation of society. We have never been more unequal in society ever. And the reason for that is actually to blame on politicians and central bankers. Politicians because we have the worst crop of politician ever. And I, I know I'm a guest in your country, but I think you are very close to the top in terms of having the worst politician in the world. So I, I make apologies already for, uh, for, for taking a stand on that. You do also live, in my opinion, in the one country that have all the abilities to be a beautiful, strong, and prosperous country. So I'm not down on you. I'm just down on your politicians. But the inability, the, so, so understand that the policymakers and the, the world today is driven by one goal only. And that is to be able to carry forward all the, the debt that we have created in the world. So 75% of all quantitative easing, 75% of all the money raised through currency devaluations is used to service already in place debt. So although we create more debt and although credit gets cheaper and cheaper globally, the only thing it does is to maintain the pile of debt that we have in place. Very little of the new generated monetary policy goes directly to investments. It is so bad, actually, that as an economist, I had to come up with an economic theory. You cannot be an economist and not have a theory. So I call it the Bermuda Triangle, uh, the, yeah, but, but the economics of the Bermuda Triangle. And I am very disappointed I haven't had the Nobel Prize in economics yet. Because I actually have a theory that can explain what is going on, but also explains to you how we get on from here. So every economy in the world, including the South African, has a split which is called the 80-20 split. So in South Africa, 20% of the society is the listed companies, the banks, uh, and the quasi-government entities. They get 100% of the political capital and almost 100% of the credit facilitation conducted in the economy. Whereas the 80% of the economy, which is the small and medium-sized enterprises, they get 
5% roughly of the credit and 0% of the, uh, of the um, available uh, political capital. So why is that an issue? It's an issue because when you look over time, who creates jobs? Who creates productivity in the society? Do you know how much productivity and jobs you get from the 20% that gets 100% of both? Zero. Zero. Nothing. Because the role of a big company is to buy smaller companies that are more innovative, more productive, and commercialize what they do, right? That is generally how society works. So the big companies have zero productivity and zero ability to create new jobs. That is all created in the 80%. So that's why the society maintains a status quo with the lowest productivity in history, the biggest inequality in history as well. And of course, the great irony in this 80-20 setup is that the ability to move forward is almost impossible because not only do we have this inequality, but in a number of countries, and certainly in South Africa, more than 50% of the population benefit from transfer of income from the public sector to the pockets of the individuals. And I'm not making a political point here, I'm making a mathematical, practical point. So when more than 51% of society benefits from transfer of income from the public sector, you create not only a political system, but also an economic system that wants one thing only, status quo. And the irony in terms of the game theory here is that it is totally rational for someone not to want change if they have a transfer of income from the state. But the problem is as an aggregate, as a society, of course, 51% becomes 55, 55 becomes 65, 70, 80, 85. So ultimately, we all go bankrupt. And that is the economy setup we have right now. Too much debt, a policy which is conducted to service debt, and, a, and an equilibrium model which is totally out of whack where the riches are getting rich, richer and the poor are getting poorer. The beauty, however, is that if you look fundamentally about economics and think about it, there are really only two ways to be more prosperous. It is to have demographic growth, where South Africa is in a good position, and then is productivity. Everything else that goes into the model called the economy is mean reversion. In, a, in other words, if you have a surplus, another country have a deficit, if investment plans goes up and down but follow a path. So what we can really change, the dynamics we can operate under is actually productivity. And there I have sad news for you, ladies and gentlemen. We also have right now the lowest productivity ever in history. And we know from 100 years of research that the way you get more productivity, the way you create a better society is all about education and the average IQ, the average level of understanding. If you look at the world from who has the highest GDP per capita, the 10 richest countries in the world has one thing only in common, that is superior educational system, superior average education of people. And I'm sorry to make the conclusion in front of you, ladies and gentlemen, but if there is a direct correlation between productivity and IQ, you are the most stupid generation ever in history. Or we are. That's a fact. I'm not, uh, I'm not claiming this. I'm deducting it from the fact that if we have the lowest productivity, we also have the dumbest IQ ever in history. I don't know about you, but I feel that matches pretty well with what goes on in the world. Our children spend more time on Facebook and Twitter and s new applications I don't even know the name of, relatively to doing basic research or understanding society. We have stopped talking to each other. We only meet and read things that agrees with what we already is predisposed to mean. And we are all afraid of that inevitable change that needs to happen in society. So going back to the Brexit again, rounding this sort of short economic lecture off, what I'm saying is that the Brexit, whether it happened a yes or a no as an end result, doesn't matter. What matters is that monetary policy is at the end road, politicians are at the end road, and the ability to just buy more time has disappeared. And that is good news, ladies and gentlemen. So in other words, I said this before, now I actually mean it. I am the most positive, optimistic about the future I've been in 30 years because it cannot get any worse.
And you say, well, in Africa we have, South Africa, we have the August local election. Yes, but let's promise you, ladies and gentlemen, the dilution of the political powers is already happening. The ability of them to continue to rule as they have been in the last 10 years has disappeared. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm on thin ground here, but look in the ANC. ANC made a legitimate claim to run South Africa, but they misused it. So what that needs to happen now is a dilution of their power. Because when you look at history, the strongest nations, the most prosperous nation in the world, have a balanced parliament, have a balanced power. If you look at the old kingdoms, if you look at the most prosperous nation in the world, they had a strong government and they had a strong opposition. No one was able to rule on their own. You need the pendulum in South Africa to go to a 50-50 split. And as I will say later, preferably your politicians should do nothing for the next 10 years. And then all of a sudden South Africa will start winning in cricket again and, uh, and uh, growth will be positive and uh, jobs will be coming back and the education level will improve, but we get back <coughs> to that. But Brexit becomes a catalyst for change, but a positive change. It's a bit like when you go to the airport, you know, when you come to security control, there's two ways to go through it. There is the fast track and there is the normal track. But if you think about it, really, it doesn't really matter whether you take the fast track or the slow track, because you're going to board the same plane and you're going to arrive exactly at the same time, right? So the analogy I'm doing here is that Brexit makes, it, makes us go through the fast track, so things will happen faster than they would have had in the slow track. But the ultimate destiny, the ultimate end goal is change, is reform, is a more broad-based think about the vision of South Africa. See, I, I don't blame you for a lot of things, but I blame you for not being ambitious enough on behalf of yourself and your country. You have, in my opinion, and I go to 35 countries, you are top three or four countries I go to in the world in terms of its possibilities. But you've also been one of the worst countries to manage your ability to go forward. So, so I think Brexit becomes a very, very critical part to, to move the agenda, and I think you will already see it in the local elections. A few headlines for you, people were totally shocked. But I, I to have to be honest, I'm not trying to say I, I know anything about the future because with an IQ of 50, of course I don't. But leading into the Brexit, everyone told me, the bookmakers tells us there are 80% possibility that we stay. And I told them, listen, I don't think bookmakers is exactly what you want to listen to when you talk about political election. Uh, because first of all, bookmakers are is exactly as the answer exactly what the wages is on the, on, on, the, on, on the event. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but before last uh, premier season in the English Football League, you would have had a 5,000 to 1 for Leicester to win the championship. And just to tell you how, to, to let, make you understand how big that odds were, I'll tell you that the odds of having a sighting of Elvis is 1 to 2,500. A sighting of the Loch Ness Monster is 1 to 1,500. You want to listen to people who have that kind of ratio, 1 to 5,000 English champions, Loch Ness and Elvis being sighted again, having lower odds. Not exactly the crowd I want to hang out with when I'm trying to predict the future for anything going on. And of course, people forgot that the social metrics and the ability of them to rule. And now all these politicians are just big crybabies. You know, one is worse than the other, and no one is wanting to take responsibility. I'm hitting the wrong buttons. So, the f I mean, it's very rarely you see a French new people using English words, but apparently they, they felt with this cartoon they need a little bit of good luck. But I don't think that's the case. Think about the UK and the task to stand in front. The world has 7.5 billion people. Europe now, after UK left, has 440 million people. So even if Europe never wants to trade with the UK again, the UK still have a market of seven billion people they can talk to. And probably without the restrictions of a lot of the policy that has driven Europe to where it is today. But let's not forget either that when we talk about the Europe-UK relationship, UK will be the biggest nation in terms of population in 2030 in Europe with 80 billion people. UK has by far the biggest military power of any countries in Europe. They have the biggest financial markets. And in my opinion, they have the best political and judicial system as well with it. 
On top of that, they have a huge deficit with the rest of Europe. So if you want Europe to go, down, go under and go bankrupt, you should stop trading with the UK. But I don't think even the French are that stupid, to be honest. So don't believe what people are saying. Do believe and do understand that this transition is going to sound through the media at least. And the media tends to exaggerate everything like a very negative things. I actually think, and I said this in public, I think the Brexit vote to leave is the best thing that happened in my children's life. Because without them, we would not have been in the fast track to the changes that needs to happen in the UK, in EU, in America, in Asia, and certainly in South Africa. But now we need to move on to what is really matter of the market. But from a perspective of like, so people are very negative about the, the pounds is collapsing, sterling is collapsing, right? See, I'm old enough, I know I look much, much younger than, than I am, but uh, I was around in 92, and unfortunately I was in 87. In 1992, we had what was called the EIM crisis, where pound totally collapsed. <coughs> and it actually collapsed less than we did on Friday. Do you see what happens to growth in the UK afterwards? And here you have the uh, FTSE. So this is the collapse of the stock market, equivalent to what we saw on Friday. And this is the FTSE afterwards. There is nothing that dictates that changes are not good for the economy. The UK runs a twin deficit, they run a current account deficit and a budget deficit. Can anyone tell me the last year that UK ran a surplus on the current account? 1982, World Cup in Spain. So the reason sterling is going down is not the Brexit. The reason sterling is going down is because they have the lowest productivity in G7 they run a dual deficit and have been running accumulated debt cycle forever. They have a country which GDP is driven almost entirely by the financial sector and real estate investments. Two sectors which have how much productivity in them? Zero. So what the UK now needs to do is not dissimilar to what South Africa needs to do. It's fine, it's all root. The educational system needs to be widened. The web needs to be invited in terms of the framework, and the UK will do that. I'm Danish. The only reason why I don't speak Russian is the English. The UK has saved Europe three times now. The, water, the Battle of Waterloo, Second World War, and the Brexit. I promise you, this is not going to be as bad as people think. It will be noisy. But remember at all times my analogy about the security line at the airport. We would have been there anyway. It would just have taken longer. And I don't know about you, but I want the pain to be over faster, not slower. And here you see the deficit. The UK has well record in not in spending more money than they have. You should almost think they were French. The problem and if you want to, to ask me what are the catalysts you need to look for in terms of direction of the market for the balance of the year and going forward, it has to be the banking sector. The banking sector is under massive attack because all of us, all banks across the world has seen and will see even more regulation. The ability to leverage in the banking system has all but disappeared. And what is important for you to understand as a bare minimum is that it is not central banks that creates credit. It is not hedge fund. It's banks. The only way a society creates more uh, lending is through the banking system. It is the banks that have the ability to leverage the deposit you put to them. So if you put, if you put one South African rand with them, on average they can do 10 rand worth of lending. That has come down from 30, 40, 50, 100 times. So the credit cage is getting smaller, and the ability for banks to actually make money has become very difficult. On top of that, as you saw Robert uh, do at the introduction, we have to do disclaimers, which is longer than most uh, children's books uh, today. But the banking sector is one catalyst. So when you look at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, also look at how is the banks doing relatively to Johannesburg. And and let me put this straight away. Uh, I'm not making a conclusion that the banking system is weak, but I think the ratio between the banking system and the r rest of the economy 
says something about the immediate future of the, uh, of the stock market. In other words, when the banks are underperforming, it will take the rest of the market down because they are the ones that create the real credit in society. So we need the banks, is basically what I'm saying. <coughs> the US presidential election, yes, I do think Trump can become president in the US. I uh, have lived in the States for many years. I have a lot of friends. And even some of the Democratic friends of mine are now saying they will vote for Trump. The polls is right now showing that Clinton will win by 10%. But you know, no one in America really publicly wants to say they're voting for Trump. And again, Trump will be become president not because of what he says, not because of, of, of uh, his political program, certainly because it's absolute rubbish what he talks about. But he is anti-establishment. And the only thing you need to be elected anywhere in the world right now is to be anti-establishment. You don't actually have to say, and a Trump is the proof, anything that makes sense. <laughs> in some ways, it's kind of beautiful. Because Trump is the end of the line, in my opinion. We have reached a level of stupidity in the political climate where someone who has no clue about anything, who's been bankrupt three times, is seen as the most potent candidate to run the biggest nation in the world. If that is not a topish sign for politics, I don't know what is. If I could go short anything for the next 30 years, it would be polit politicians. So if any of you have one way to trade a derivative of politicians, I am yours. Uh, I will deposit a huge amount of money with you. The presidential cycle, let's get down to the more nitty gritty of the market. The worst year for any equity performance in the US and globally is the eighth year of a presidential election cycle. So you know, Obama is in his eighth year. Every eighth year is the worst. So basically, it's probably the only period in equity terms which is always negative, uh, or very likely to be negative. And of course, this year so far has been a good uh, example of that. I'll come back to, to the immediate logic. But just know that the US election is gonna create another event risk, another event which we have to get past before people want to take big decisions. So everyone is delaying the inevitable. And the runoff this year, being Clinton and Trump, if you look over the very mighty names you've had in the past, Kennedy versus Nixon, a good one. Cast word it forward, I mean, we probably, you can see the, this list is not about, it's a little bit like English football, it's getting worse every single year, right? What about the Fed? What is the Fed going to do in this environment? So when we started this year, Federal Reserve told you that we will definitely hike interest rate. Not only are we gonna hike interest rate, we're gonna do it four to five times. And the market said, ah, oh, hang on a minute, you've always been wrong, actually you're 100% wrong 100% of the time. The IMF did a report on, uh, on, on uh, governments and uh, forecasting. And it turns out there are 220 incidents where a country moved from positive GDP growth to negative GDP growth. So what they did was they measured in April of the positive year, how many was able to predict that it would have negative uh, GDP growth eight months later. Out of 220 incidents, how many times do you think they were able to predict that the economy was gonna turn down? Zero, Zero exactly. So that's why you have economists with 50 IQ. We have no clue what goes on. And those employed by government are the worst. And Federal Reserve being the top notch, most idiotic people in terms of research. So the market said early on this year, they said, this is what the market thinks. The market says two, Federal Reserve was a four to five. Now the market says, and today it's gone down even further. The market today said, to the world, there's gonna be no more Fed hikes. So not only did Fed start by four to five hikes, but they in the process lost all of their credibility. I think empirically they should have lost a long time ago because if they can't predict negative growth in April of the same year for next year, I don't think they really should have a job, right? Imagine being a coach or anyone with that record, zero for 220, I don't think you would keep your job. But the point is, and more importantly, US is not gonna hike interest rates. And the reason they're not gonna hike interest rate is the following. This is Federal Reserve itself continue to claim that the one thing that's good about the US economy 
is that they have employment growth. There's only one problem. The broadest index that measured labor market in the US, and by the way, done by who? The Federal Reserve, is at all time low. So the US labor market is deteriorating every single day. We will see a swing where things will get worse. So now they're underperforming on growth. The US have had less than 3% growth every single year since the great financial crisis started. And as economies, we expect the U US to grow at 3.5%. So growth in the U.S. is two-thirds of what it should be. U.S. being one of two great growth engines for the rest of the world. The other one being the one you're a little bit more dependent on here, China. And China is also running a two-thirds capacity of their growth. But Federal Reserve, the labor market in the U.S. is going down. And even the leading indicators, this is conference board, which is what most people look at. You see the chart is not up, but massively down. So I think there is at least 60 to 70 percent probability when we get to the election in November that we have recession in the U.S. And that's why when we get to, to allocation, I've been very long U.S. fixed income. The world as a stock market topped in June 2015, ever since we've been trading sideways. This is all of the stock markets in the world capital, capitalized. And today we are all the way down here at 57 trillion. So we lost $14 trillion. Sounds like a lot of money. The good news is just paper. If you think about your, your friends and colleagues, how many in South Africa really cares about where the stock market is? 10%, seven, five, three. So we have made the stock market the parameter of what goes on in the economy. But do understand, the stock market is a sub component of the economy. And unlike what people tell you, the stock market actually doesn't lead the economy. It's the other way around. Econ economic, e economically, you will see that if you want to understand what goes on in the stock market today, you should read the data from six months ago. If you really want to understand what goes on in the South African stock market today, you should read what happened to South African rates nine months ago. So in other words, interest rates leads the economy by nine months, and the economic data leads the stock market by six months. So it takes about nine months from a change in South African interest rate policy to go all the way through into the economic system and working. So if you keep your newspapers from nine months ago and six months ago, you can explain what goes on to today. And you, I can see a lot of you are very, very skeptical, but please do the exercise. I've done the math. You can prove it for me. And in Europe, we have the same situation. And good old China, which you are very dependent on, so what happened in China was that China has been through two cycles. In eight and nine, they did a massive expansion. They were the first one during the, uh, the massive sell-off in 2008 and 2009 to do a fiscal expansion, spend money they didn't have. That sort of uh, cost them a lot of growth going on here. And then all of a sudden, end of last year, they panicked. The leadership in China panicked, and they did a massive expansion of credit. So they did 25% credit growth with a GDP growth of 6%. That is basically just creating more debt in order to get a little bit of growth. So now, in China, to get $1 worth of growth, you have to have 3 to $4 worth of debt. It's saturated the more you do this. So China growth, I have very long time, and I think certainly last time we were here, I kept talking about the one bell, one road, the internationalization of renminbi. Very, very good ideas. Very practical, very long-term looking but they panicked. And because they panicked, they now have to pay back with significantly lower growth. That's why you've seen over the last couple of weeks that the CNY, the renminbi, has moved dramatically weaker in China. So the Chinese government is now doing a competitive derivation as the only one being allowed to do so. And I'm sorry to have made this headline for South Africa, but uh, I don't think there's a more different way to say it. South Africa, what a mess. But I have to say, coming here and being on the ground has made me very optimistic uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, I think the Brexit is a good catalyst. Number two, when I, and I'm, I'm, I'm just an outsider, so, so pardon my, my ignorance, but I will, I will say, tell you why I'm pretty optimistic. The judicial system, the legal system of South Africa has shown its true phase over the last three to four months. And I think if it continues down that line and make rational, good long-term decision in terms of who 
can be impeached and not be impeached and who has to be in front of the law, I think you stand in front of a massive future because any society in history that has a judicial system at its root, who has the ability of free voice, uh, they're the society that works. And I have to say, I've been maybe naively slightly surprised at how, how strong the judicial system has been standing over the last three to six months of Africa. I also think that the fact that Julius was his name from the ANC youth, he's splitting up the ANC vote in two camps, and I think that's good. And it's not because I, I have no take in whether ANC should be ruling or not, but I like societies, as I said, which is balanced in power. The less they can actually do in parliament, the better it is. You laugh, but let me give you two examples. The country of Belgium, without a government for two years, you know what happened to every single macro indicator during that time? It massively improved. The US, during Mrs. Clinton's husband's reign, eight years, budget surplus, very strong economy. But can you tell me anything Clinton did for eight years except smoking cigars? He did nothing except constantly reminding people they had a strong dollar policy. And you know what the only thing they did officially during his eight years was? To sell the US dollar against the Mexican during the Mexican crisis. So there is a very strong belief, not just with me, but globally that an economy that doesn't grow, and you don't grow in South Africa right now, has too much macro, or in other words, too much central bank intervention and too much political intervention, and too little micro, which is the underlying economy. So it's very easy for an economist to say, if there's no growth, I know what's wrong. It is the macro. There's too much macro and too little micro. So I'm you infinitely positive about you guys individually and about South Africa, but I have to be very negative and say to you, the macro in South Africa is a big mess. And I can, of course, show that pretty quickly with a few charts. Business confidence right now in South Africa is almost as low as it was at the low in 2009. And this is your GDP growth. Again, if this was a football coach, he would have been out of office many, many years ago. But it's, of course, the problem is, however, also that it's very easy to find someone to point fingers at. But in, in, in reality, the South African economy, because you have done nothing, because you have done no reforms, because you've become a society of transfer of income from one pocket to another, 95% of what happens to the South African society over the next 12 months will be dictated by external factors. And I can tell you, the direction of the US dollar is 50% minimum of that 95%. So if you can tell me where the US dollar is at the end of the year, 10% stronger or 10% weaker, I can tell you what growth will be in South Africa. Because let us imagine that, which I think it will happen ultimately, US dollar is 10% weaker. Then emerging market will be stronger commodity prices will be higher, gold prices certainly will be higher, then there'll be more growth in the emerging market. The emerging market will buy more commodity goods as more uh, engineering goods from Europe and vice versa, growth in the world will go up. On the other hand, if we have a stronger dollar, and understand the reason why we have a dollar in the world right now is because the US capital market is simply much, much bigger than anyone else. And since the great financial crisis started, we have created an additional $60 trillion worth of debt most of it originated in US dollars. So not only do we have a currency reserve globally called the dollar, commodity traded in dollar, but all of the debt being issued in the world pretty much is also in dollar. So when South African rand goes to 17 and you are a corporation borrowing a US dollar, your ability to repay has just been diminished basically, right? So we know for a fact if the dollar is 10% stronger, you will have recession not only in South Africa, but globally. If the US dollar is 10% weaker, there is hope. It is not a panacea, but it is and will be a support for the market. And that's exactly what we saw in the early part of this year. You saw dollar come off, and you immediately saw the reaction in terms of uh, uh, better commodity prices. And the mining index, of course, has been one of the best performers this year across Africa, but also across the globe. So this is uh, my position, but I'll jump that because I found yesterday that uh, you all want to basically see so how do I navigate this market? So I know with an IQ of 50, I have to be very, very, very conservative, right? 
So a few years ago, actually many years ago, I read about a Jewish principle and, and, and then it became a book. And this book stated that if you take your money, 100%, your pot of money being 100%, you have all the time to put 25% in equity, 25% in commodity, 25% in fixed income, and 25% in real estate. The Jewish principle, I think, is one-third, 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 but for argument's sake, it, that's been around for 200 years. But 25% in fixed income, 25% in equity, 25% in commodity, and 25% in real estate, that has yielded over the last 30 years roughly about 900 basis points per year. So 9% 9, 9 return. That beats 95% of all active fund managers in the world. And you don't even have a pay, pay fee for it. So what you do in this principle is that you have 25% and quarterly, so let's say the stock market goes up in value, so your stock market valuation goes from 25% to 30%. Into the quarter, you sell the 5% and buy what is not performing. So you're constantly averaging back to 25%. So during the sell-off in 2008, you would have been buying more stocks because your 25% became 18 and 15%, and constantly you were averaging up. Meanwhile, your, stock por your bond portfolio would have been rising by more, actually, than the stock market came down. So, you, so the portfolio like this came out of 2008 with a small plus. And I think it is important, and that's the conversation you need to have with Rob and his team, you need to understand that 80% of the return you have as investors is not, unfortunately, because you're smarter than the rest. I'm sure a few of you are smarter, but in principle, 80% of your return is asset allocation. So there's a Jewish tradition that goes back 100 years that says one third in each of these categories. And there is, you know, this is the, uh, the, the model that, that, that uh, is called parity uh, risk today. Bridgewater, the world's biggest hedge fund, is actually built on this very principle. And the way I'm doing it presently and have been allocating it, so you see here, I'm, I have 25% normally but once in a while, I, 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 I deviate from that. And what I've had, had on for the last uh, more than three months is that I've had underweight in stocks because, as I told you before, I actually thought Brexit and, and the world was getting a little bit expensive. So I only have 10% right now. I have been massively long. I've been owning a lot of uh, fixed income in the U.S. because U.S. fixed income pays an excess return of over 100 basis points to the rest of the world the safest bond market in the world, the biggest money printing machine in the world, I had to have some of that. So I have been uh, almost 40% long. And I've been long gold and overweight, especially gold, but a commodity of all. I, I've been very long uh, mining companies uh, uh, in it. And then I have a small old underweight in real estate and, uh, and alternative asset managers. So this portfolio, I've designed to see lower US growth, which is starting to happen an increased geopolitical re risk, a weak banking sector, plus very soft growth from China. So, and as I write here, for me, 2016 is a transition from one paradigm, from one economic system into a new beginning. And there'll be a lot of false starts. I'm not necessarily sure that 2017 will be, be significantly better, but I think there are the biggest opportunities you will ever see in your trading career uh, right now. So let me end by, by showing you this picture on the trading floor at home. We have a bull and a bear, and generally in my speeches, people come up to me after and say, you're very negative, Steen. I mean, so negative, we don't really understand it. So to make sure you understand my message today about the Brexit, about the dollar, dollarization of the economy, about what is in front of us, I took a picture with a bull. Of course, little did I realize that it looks more like I'm being run down by the bull than actually believing this bull. But I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, I really firmly believe we stand in front of a massive, massive change. The, don't read the media, listen to yourself, be investing in productivity, in education across the board. And for the first time, you, I'll just show you my portfolio. Today, I've been buying risk, so I'm actually reducing my underweight in equity right now. I bought the European stock market today, I bought the American stock market today to reduce it. So now I'm going back to 25, 25, 25. I don't think there's anything to be afraid of. I know there's a lot of noise, but we have to understand change is good. So let me end by my, my second and only the own joke. And that is, you know, every year for Christmas, I write Santa Claus. You know, I'm 51 years old, but it doesn't hurt, right? 
And I said, Santa Claus, I'll be a good boy again next year if he does one thing for me. I want him to take all the world's politicians, all the world's central bankers, all the world's chief economists, and now I want him to give a call into the Prime Minister of Australia, borrow a big plot of land, put in restaurants, tennis courts, golf courses, prostitutes, whatever these guys use, and then seal it off for five years, and I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a perfect society. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take some questions, unless I have to press you so much you want to go out and uh, get drunk. First you, and then the gentleman on the back. So actually, I think South Africa and Australia stands out to me as two countries that have, or if we're talking 10, 15 years forward. Australia significantly because Australia's third biggest export commodity is actually education. As you probably may or may not know, every single Asian person of any means goes to Australia to get an education. So that means Australia is very well positioned for spin-off, productivity, basic research. <coughs> On top of that, they are the most lazy people in the world, in my opinion. A little bit like you guys, they can actually go into the ground and just dig up whatever they need and sell it and produce it and eat it, right? So, so I think so, so Australia stands in front of a massive change, which is going to come from what I believe in, which is education, better infrastructure. I think South Africa probably has better valuations right now in terms of the long-term future, but you have to sit through this pendulum swing of, the, uh, of, of politics. And let me say, I, I'm not being, you know, very critical or very negative about the political system. In, well, I am, but, 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 but I understand historically when you are a relatively new emerging democracy as you are, the pendulum swing has to go from one end and or to the other end of the spectrum in order to come into the middle. What is happening right now in, in South Africa, in my opinion, is we are getting the pendulum swing back towards the middle. And that is always very productive. That is very, very, very pr uh, good for growth. So I would say those are the two ones are, are the free. And then I have to say, although they are the most boring people in the world, I have massive fascination with uh, both the Swiss and the Japanese. I think Japan, Japan right now, in terms of metrics, if you just want to talk about an equity play, is one of the cheapest uh, equity plays you can have. They have the second highest patent library in the world. They have, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful societies in terms of this homogeneity, the way they deal with services, the respect they have for each other, the respect they have for elderly. I mean, if you haven't been to Japan, please go if you can afford it. It is an amazing place. And it's totally undervalued in terms of how people perceive it. I mean, everyone thinks Japan is in a massive crisis, but trust me, if you go to Tokyo, you don't feel like you're in a crisis, you feel like you're a paradise. And the other one is Switzerland. Switzerland has by far the most productive model. Why? Because they have an extremely strong framework for the SME, for the tax code, for the judicious system. And on top of that, when you look at currency laws around the world, Japan leads by having the most stupid one, uh, followed closely by South Africa and others who thinks that you can devalue yourself out of problem. In Switzerland, they have seen stronger Swiss franc every single year since World War II. What do they do when they need a stronger currency? They make a better quality product and they become more productive. Switzerland, with one of the strongest currencies in the world, runs a current account surplus of 11% to GDP. And ladies and gentlemen, they don't export banking or chocolate unless what people say. It is the middle stand, it is the SME, it is the small business guys who constantly pump out new products, better products, engineering products to the rest of the world in Europe and, and around the world. They have more bilateral trade agreements than any other nation in the world. They are the best traders in the world in terms of what they do. So that would be my, my, my choice for, for countries. But definitely, I'm a, I'm a big fan of this country, medium and long term. Yes, sir, I owe you at the back, and then you, sir. So, not very simple question, by the way, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I'll try and have a stab at it. 
Federal Reserve should theoretically be indifferent to where the dollar goes because it's not part of the mandate they have, which is, of course, stable uh, inflation rate and employment, full employment. But as you've seen, and I think that's what you're alluded to probably, what we've seen in the FOMC, the Federal Reserve statement over the last five meetings, is that the external factor continues to be one of the excuses why they don't hike interest rates. So the true answer is that the dollar and the value of the dollar matters, in my opinion, about 60-70% of the explanation for where Fed goes. So in the past, we will look at the employment level in the U.S. and inflation level, and from that derive, what would the future policy rate be? The Federal Reserve right now has no clue, having no clue, they do what everybody else do, they watch the direction of the dollar. That's the first, the second, so I, I'm so 50 IQ, I can only keep one question at a time. The second one? Oh yeah, so in the allocation, yeah. So, so you know my principle is that 80% of the exercise you need to do is actually figuring out what the weight should be in the four different levels, right? But if you, if you look underneath that, of course you can apply a top-down or a, a, a bottom-up analysis to what it goes. So what I have my people do in the equity space, for instance, which I think is what you specifically look at, is, is like saying, you know, Japan is cheap. Uh, my equity analyst today on the banking sector put out that the divid expected dividend yield in the banking sector right now is 4.5% against the policy rate, which is... Uh, uh, is the policy rate of Europe, which is negative, right? So you have 4.5% owning the stock and dividend yield and with relative predictable earnings for the next 12 months. Of course, the counter argument would be, yeah, but do you know where earnings is going to be over seven years? But everything being equal, that's what we look at. We look at the bottom-up analysis, but I am far too stupid to do that stuff, so I have people doing that. But I will select individual market on that basis, and then if I understand it, I will, I will also take the advice I get from these very young quant guys I have doing it. But certainly, I can, I can name what markets are cheap and what markets are expensive. And I think many years ago, and every year, Barron's, the financial newspaper US, is doing an analysis of the marketplace. And what they always constantly say, if you want to have a winning strategy, every quarter you want to sell what's expensive and you want to buy what is cheap. So we have, effectively, if you do big simulation of data for a financial market, 75% of the time we mean revert, meaning what is, was cheap becomes expensive, what is expensive becomes cheap, and it's all the big average. And 25%, like last week, we have huge momentum swings that changes the equilibrium, and then we start the mean reversion again. Does that make sense as, a, as an answer? Yes, sir, and then you, sir. It's totally balanced. The, the point here is to have no view. No, 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 no. No, I know, I mean, I, I, you know, talk to, I mean, <laughs> disclaim, talk to Robert, he's the expert. But for me, personally, I don't think it matters whether I'm 80 or 82. I, by the way, I'm going to be working until I die. I love this market, I love looking at this market, and maybe I can get myself all the way up to 55 IQ, that is my goal, right? But, but, the, but the point is, to what you say, it doesn't matter, this works unilaterally. You know, the, your, you, the reason why it works is that, if you think about these five, four, Think it at like four quadrants of, uh, think it like a, 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 a cross, right? And you have four segments in it. What is smart about this is that for every high inflation, low growth, for high inflation, high, high growth, for every single economic scenario you have, you have a count on balance in the asset allocation by having 25-25. So the principle here is that you're giving away relative to being 100% in equity some of the upside, but in the downdraft, you have the protection. So if I would, and, and again, disclaim that I'm just a bloody out foreigner, right? But if you look at JZ right now, it's, it's come down, but it's done extremely well, mainly because, of course, 70% of the earnings in the JZ is foreign earnings, and as the South African is weaker, it's almost, in my opinion, unpatriotic how the JZ is, is, is weighted towards foreign earnings, but, but, but as a joke. But if you look at JSE right now and you look at an onshore business, I would definitely be buying fixed income in, in, in South Africa because although you don't think you know anything about in interest rate, you do know that the stock market has yielded you excess return for a number of years. It needs to mean reverse slightly lower. If there is a big crisis, fixed income will yield you protection not only 
in terms of its yield and what it gives you in terms of action money and account, but it, it actually improves your sub radius, your ability to sustain whatever downdraft. So if you have 100% equity or 75 equity, balancing out at a bare minimum of 25% fixed income will actually make you more money over time than just owning the market outright. So it's more about the balance of life. It's basically saying, I have no view, I accept that having this set up gives you a yield roughly. In South Africa, the yield is actually very big because the fixed income component will give you 9% roughly, right? So you have a component here called fixed income in South Africa, 25%, 9% yield. Dividend yield in the JSE, Robert? Free? So you have 12% between the two, right? You have a carry of 12% in just having a 50-50. On top of that, you would have made money this year in, in mining and, and, and commodities. And you probably made a little bit of money in real estate, re uh, relative to speaking, right? So the point here is that you would have had a return in a market that's been desperately bad. You probably had a return this year of, so JC is down 4%, roughly, 3%, 2%. Yeah, but fixed income have at, at least compensated for, I'm pretty sure of that. Certainly now you kept the, the, uh, the rating. So, so it's, it's about balance. It's about the 80% asset allocation generating your main return. Whether you, as this gentleman was asking, own XYZ stock, over time doesn't matter. It matters inside a quarter, sometimes inside a year, but over a five, 10 year period, it's about owning you know, stocks that has a product that's worth buying. Does that answer the question? Oh, you, sir? Yeah, in 92. Yeah, so you feel that employment and price, housing prices and that will, come, will increase in the short to medium term is my first question. And then the other one is, there's a lot of rumors regarding Brexit being revoked in terms of you know, Article 15 not being enacted at this stage, people voting. What do you think the chances are of that? And will this, I mean, we'll never undo this now because you've got to be used the two channel thing, but what do you think of so Article 50 is the treaty's exit clause uh, to get out of the EU. It stipulates that you have two years to exit, and when you exit, you should actually have in place what relationship you will have going forward with the EU. So it's actually a very practical way of resetting the UK's relationship with the EU. The reason why there's all this commotion and, f and, 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 and noise around it right now is that Cameron, of course, feels that he is not the right person to invoke the Article 50. First of all, because he was very strong on the stay side. And secondly, he, why would he, being a little bit childish, but why would he have to negotiate something the other side of the aisle sort of decided to do against it, all right? I don't think, I would be very disappointed with democracy if we have a second vote. And, and there's nothing from Cameron, there's nothing from the general political establishment that support that view. There is now, you know, FT this morning, I think, carried an article by an economist saying that he felt it's very likely there's never going to be an exit. I think there needs to be an exit. Uh, so, so my personal opinion is this is just political noise. They're all big crybabies who, uh, who can't accept. I mean, they talk about the Brexit like it was a marginal loss, right? But there was 20 million people who voted leave. 20 million people. It wasn't 20,000. It was... 20 million people who voted leave. What they, what they really said is leave us alone, politician. That was what they really said. So I think they're really having a hard time negotiating that the media, all of the political parties, the banks, everybody was f for staying and still they have a, la a leave vote, right? Uh, that is what creates that first part of the view. And again, with the IQ of 50, what was the first question? Just the, the short to medium. Yeah, short to medium term. So, I'm not saying that this is 92 repeated, it's all good, it was gonna happen. I think in terms of real estate, this is the easiest part. The reason real estate in the UK will not do well, in my opinion, has nothing to do with the Brexit, but has to do with the changes of the tax law. So you may or may not know the Panama Papers has made the government come out and say that every foreigner who owns a property in the UK have to register publicly. So UK for all, and I love the UK, I still think it's a superior system in any shape and form. You could go to the UK as a South African, as a Dane, and you didn't have to register as long as you didn't need the public services, right? That is changing. Everything is coming online. Everybody is digitalized. That makes the appeal, the safe haven status of England less. There's a few Russian oligarchs. There are a few princes around the world 
who doesn't want, know the, want the public to know how much money they have in UK real estate. That is a net negative. Cost of capital, I think pretty much the same, but if you, like in Johannesburg, if you go around, there are cranes everywhere in London. By the way, I don't get how many cranes you have in South Africa and you have a recession. I, don't, you know, I need to study that uh, phenomenon a little bit. Every time I come, there's more cranes and there's less growth. Normally it's the other way around, but uh, maybe it's, this is Africa, right? And in terms of the marketplace, what I'm saying really is that no one knows. We have to be honest. You know, all, you know, George Osborne, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, he told you before the Brexit that in 2030, the average income in the UK family was down by 2,300 pounds. This is the same guy who cannot predict what the deficit is going to be next month. How can he say what's going on in 2030? That's, that's so dishonest, it's beyond my, my imagination. And again, there are 7 billion people who will love to do more business with the UK. You would love to do more business with the UK, I'm sure, right? So this is not going to change anything. It will change the noise, it will have short-term implications. The fact is sterling pounds should come down because they run a trend deficit. Now they'll have a massive boost of competitiveness. If that's follow up with education and, and better infrastructure and the likes, then they will improve. So, so you know, I'm, not, I'm just trying to be balanced, not to be the, the scaremongering here. But I think uniquely the real estate market have challenges because the safe haven status of UK has changed through the, the, the non-domicile tax uh, registration and now registration of real foreign real estate which comes basically as a derivative of the Panama Papers. Make sense? One more question. Yes, sir. So if, uh, assume that Brexit goes through, and if you had some money now, would you put it in the UK or would you put it in Europe? Very good questions. Fortunately, I don't have any money. I'm an underpaid economist. Uh, question, so <laughs> um, actually, I'll buy both. A and I have to tell you about your first. So the interesting thing about Europe, and I come to pretty much every single country, all 28 during a, a, an average year, I am the most optimistic I, I've been in my career about Europe. Why? Because Europe all of a sudden have a productive base in the former Eastern Europe. If you drive a German car in Europe, the engine, the chassis, uh, the whatever, all the components are built in Poland, Hungary, Croatia, uh, Bulgaria. They have great labor force, cheap labor force and the intellectual capital sits with the traditional Western countries. Europe as a whole, in my opinion, still have a superior uh, educational system overall. And uh, I'm European, I also think we have a pretty good culture and, and, and history of, of you know, engaging. Uh, so Europe is in a very good position if we can just get Brussels to stop all the noise and, and the politicians to stay away for five years, as we talked about. So when Europe comes back, it will not be driven by Germany, it will not be driven by France, it will be driven by a lot of small countries doing better. And what is interesting is that Portugal, Spain, Greece, and to some extent Italy, now for the first time since the Euro was introduced, have lower unit labor costs than Germany. So basically by introducing the Euro, Germany stopped everyone else from devaluing and getting competitive advantages relative to them. That is now run out because Germany is ex massively expensive to do business in, and in terms of labor market, relatively complex still. So. But in terms of the UK, if what, I mean, what I'm very, very certain about, I will invest in Europe. I will also invest in the UK, but I just need to see that they go through with the Brexit and they actually do what they are telling us they will do. But I'm a massive long of both markets. I really think both these markets will do extremely well. And they are cheap relative to the US uh, in metric terms and, and, and in terms of what goes on. Yeah, and that's the negative now. In the next cycle, that's negative. They, they got the, the rest of the, of the economy is virtually nothing. They're going to restart the rest of the economy. Absolutely. Unless they can protect the financial institutions. Yep. Uh, isn't it a big risk to the UK because they may not be able to protect them the same way? Yeah, but, but, but you know, if you go to Cambridge or you're Oxford, the spin-off of, uh, from the university in medical, pharma, uh, Cambridge quantum computing is one of only five, I think, big, quantum projects in the world. It's a spin-off from, uh, I mean, 
I think you and I, to some extent, I'm sure we, we look at the capital, we look at, we see London and we don't see the rest. But when you go into Cambridge, Oxford, you go to Glasgow, you have, you have very, very strong uh, microcosmos of people who do. There's some success story recently. I think the biggest game in the world, I don't know which is this Game of Thrones or whatever it is called, comes out of a, a little boutique in Glasgow. I think you are underestimating the ability of people. I think, like in South Africa, we can deal with any adversity they throw at us if they just could keep quiet, right? We can deal with bad taxes. I go to 35 countries. I, meet, I go to dictatorships. I go to the most open democracies. What I'm, I'm enthusiastic about is the fact I meet people like yourself, sir, smart, willing to change, willing to listen, willing to do the job everywhere I go in the world. I cannot meet people like you and not be optimistic. But every time I go in to see a policymaker or a central banker, I get so depressed I want to commit suicide, right? because they think they know what's going on. You're saying, I don't know what's going on, but I'm very good at doing this, and I will continue to do this, whatever these stupid idiots doing to me, right? <laughs> so you're doing everything in almost in spite. Imagine if the system actually left you alone for two to three years to do your job, right? So, so don't get down on your South Africa. Don't get down on I me. Mean, you are in a group of people who are very smart, so I take everything back. You're not the most stupid generation. <laughs> you're just the most lazy. <laughs> good. So thank uh, you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, just in conclusion, Sten will be staying behind for a while, and it's quite interesting because um, this, for, uh, this, this portfolio, you can actually replicate this portfolio on our platforms. Um, locally, you can go into our ETF-only product, so you can buy each of the ETFs, and then you might be wondering why Saxo Bank and APSA. Well, Saxo Bank is our partner for our offshore platform, and our offshore platform is called World Trader. And on World Trader, you've got access to 19,000 shares, 35 markets. And again, you can replicate this whole portfolio on World Trader. So you can buy, for example, uh, S&P 500 ETF, um, the fixed income as well, the US. So you can replicate all of this. So uh, we'll be staying behind. And um, this is also new to me. So uh, we might launch a thing called Macromania Portfolio going forward. Who knows? Thank you very much. Safe journeys.